Hi everybody, it's time for story time with Nona and I've got a continuation of our book we did last time, The Album of Horses. And this was one of my favorites as a child. It talks about all the different breeds of horses and today's story, well, let me just introduce the title, Album of Horses by Marguerite Henry, illustrated by one of my personal favorites, Wesley Dennis. So let's get started with the Welsh Mountain Pony. And that's a favorite of many children that like to jump and go into the show ring. Blue ribbons, red ribbons, yellow ribbons, white ribbons. In show classes for ponies, sometimes there is more than one kind of champion. The blue ribbon pony and also the boy whose pony just misses. For one hurt second, the boy blinks back his tears, pretending he doesn't care. And then in a flash, he really doesn't. He remembers the time his pony carried him down the slippery sides of a stone quarry until they stood at the very bottom of the cup, then up and up again to the dizzying rim above the whole wide world. And he remembers the day his pony jumped across a deep ravine and all the others balked. <clears throat> Remembering all this, he strokes the sleek necks, swings astride, and bravely trots his pony out of the ring behind the winner. The judge, with a deep sigh of relief, mops his forehead. There go two champions, he murmured to no one at all. The light gray Welsh and that thoroughbred boy astride the dark one. More and more, big shows and small ones are offering classes for the best ponies, and more and more, the finely made Welsh is coming out of obscurity to carry away the blue ribbons. He is frequently the graduation mount for the boy or girl whose legs have grown too long for the Shetland. Who would suspect that the ancestors of this delicate made pony were half wild refugees hiding in the craggy mountains of Wales escaping one enemy only to meet another. First, they were hunted and tracked down by the sheep herders who looked upon them as thieves of the juicy grasses belonging to their sheep. Often, the herders would capture a band, kill off the colts for food, and throw the scraps to their dogs. These sheep dogs were as strong as wolves, and once having tasted pony meat, they hunted the little fellows themselves, stealing up on them silently without the least warning. A mare would be grazing peacefully and suddenly she would look up to see a snarling dog ready to leap at her foal. In a flash, she was between them, springing at the killer with her forefeet, then driving the young one into a gallop through, a na through narrow passes up a steep scarp, leaping from ledge to ledge until at last they were safe in the folds of the mountains. Tiny colts only a few weeks old had to learn to take their first jumps to save their lives. Some were strong enough to escape. When they did, they became nimble and wondrously wise. But the sheep herders and their dogs were only small annoyances. The law was a bigger enemy. It reached out from the throne of England and shoved the ponies deeper and deeper into the mountains. King Henry VIII, with a gesture of his jeweled hands, decreed that little horses and nags of small stature must be killed and others fled into the mountain fastnesses. Here they found a quiet tableland high above the grazing ground, yet even here they were attacked. Now winter was their enemy, biting with the sharp fangs of wind, howling into their ears, spitting hail and sleet at them. 
Sometimes the herds had to sneak down into the valleys to find food, but hardships strengthened. And so it was with the ponies. Those who survived developed hooves as flinty as the rocks they climbed and hawks and haunches like steel springs and lung and heart room to send them traveling like the will of the wisps. No, enemies did not stamp out the spirited Welsh pony. They only made him stronger, hardier, wiser, and above all, they preserved the purity of his blood. By not mixing with other breeds, he remained distinct. There is a fierceness about the Welsh pony, a kind of nobility in his bearing, as if he knows that in his veins flows the blood of the Arabian. It shows in the refinement of his head, in his dished face, his pint pot muzzle, even in his color. Never is there a piebald or skewbald among the true Welsh mountain ponies. They are bay, brown, or chestnut, with grays predominating, just as in the Arab. At first, people wondered how the blood of the horse of the desert found its way into the Welsh mountains. Then, as they began to ask questions, it became clear. In faraway times, had not the Romans invaded Wales? And was it not likely that they had brought with them the spoils of their campaigns in Africa, the desert ponies that satisfied the eye for beauty and their need for a quick flight? For 400 years, the Arabs had occupied Wales, importing more and more Arabian horses, which mingled with the native wild herds. Their offspring became pack ponies for the Romans, but they did not look like pack, po pack ponies at all. They had the elegant form of the Arabian, and they were fleet of foot like the Arabian. In truth, they were diminutive Arabians. But Henry VIII was not one to appreciate the fine symmetry of these ponies. Hence his decree, which almost wiped out the Welsh mountain pony. It was a long road, however, that has no turning. Today the ponies still live high on the tablelands, and when winter overstays, they are not afraid to nimble foot down the mountains. The hand of man is friendly now, even when it captures some of the fillies and colts for breeding purposes. The curious truth is that these creatures thrive in captivity, yet no matter where they go, they cling to their wild pony characteristics. They jump a brush hurdle as high and clean as if the sheepdog were snapping at their heels, and at the walker trot, they pick up their feet and place them carefully, as though testing the earth for loose pieces of shale. Even in America, they have this heather step. Perhaps the ponies of Wales are like the Welsh people, who, in a changing world, cling steadfastly to their ancient language and customs. They are like them in another respect, too. On the Welsh coat of arms, a motto describes the people. The words of the motto are, Ich dien, I serve. Every Welshman who understands pony character insists that Ik Dean describes the mountain pony too, for he serves his master well. No wonder he is a champion, and when the blue ribbon comes his way, he wears it in his headstall as if to the manner born. I hope you enjoyed that story about the Welsh mountain pony. I know I did. I was just to read and reread this book, and I hope you find it as fascinating as I did. Anyway, we're all done for today, but I hope you'll join us when we return with one more story out of the album of horses. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you next time on Storytime with Nona. Until then, bye!
Thank you.